Hi, everybody, and welcome to the fifth event of uh, this month's Red May. Uh, we're a month-long teach-in. Uh, we offer a vacation from capitalism. Our motto is pretend for a month that the market is not the solution of the problems that the market creates. Uh, not hard to believe uh, when we're trying to uh, uh, trying to get a uh, public health system quickly cobbled together through just-in-time production. Uh, we're about to present national security after a viral Pearl Harbor, but uh, uh, before I introduce the panelists, I would like to mention some of the events that are coming up in the next week. Uh, on Wednesday, there's a, a panel called How to Liberate Technology from Capitalism uh, with Nick Dyer Witherford, uh, Chris Natale, James Steinhoff, Elise Thorburn, and Wendy Liu on, that is at 1 p.m. on Wednesday. Uh, at 6 p.m. on uh, Thursday night, uh, we have the Antifada podcast with Andy Gitlitz and Jamie Peck. Uh, they'll be talking to Aaron Bananev, uh, Annie McClanahan, and uh, Magali Miranda Alcazar on the coronavirus and the future of work. Uh, and on Saturday at uh, 1 p.m., uh, what do we have on Saturday at 1 p.m.? It kind of slips my mind at the moment. Uh, well, I'll have to look at the calendar. Maybe I'll get back to you on that. Let's, let's uh, before I go to where we are and uh, introduce the panelists here, I have to mention that Red May is uh, an event that has no institutional support. Uh, uh, an event whose slogan is take a vacation from capitalism is not gonna find very much. So we depend on the kindness of strangers. Uh, go to our website, www.redmayseattle.org and uh, click on donate and give us whatever you can so we can keep doing, going and doing more of these events uh, in the years to come. Uh, but now let's get started today on uh, uh, national security after a viral Pearl Harbor. I'm uh, very happy to have here uh, uh, Daniel Bessner, who is the Pyle, Prof Pyle Assistant Professor of American Foreign Policy at the University of Washington. Uh, he's uh, the author of uh, Democracy in Exile, Hans Spire and the Rise of the Defense Intellectual, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And he's working on a new book, uh, uh, I believe on the Rand Corporation. Is that correct, Andrew? Your uh, your second book is your book coming up is on the Rand Corporation. Uh, yeah, Dan Daniel. Yeah, yeah. It, it it is it is hopefully on the Rand Corporation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, we also have uh, Adam Gatachu, who is the assistant professor of political science at the University of Chicago. Uh, author of a very interesting book called World Making After Empire about what's commonly called decolonization, but which, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, you believe is much better described as the attempt to replace a world of empire with a new world that is not empire, a process that hasn't been completed yet. Um, uh, Nikhil Singh is uh, uh, professor of, uh, help me out with your title again, uh, Nikhil. I'm a, my memory is going a little here. Oh, well, Nikhil anyway is the author of uh, 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 Race and America's Long War, uh, Black as a Country, and he's working on a new book. Uh, he's a professor at NYU. Uh, Andrew Basevich is uh, uh, Professor Emeritus at, at uh, Boston, Boston University and uh, is also the president of the Quincy Institute. He's the author of many books like American Empire, uh, Washington Rules, uh, America's War for the Greater Near East. Um, Gene Moorfield is an assistant professor, is a senior lecturer at the University of Birmingham and uh, has written much about empire, uh, uh, particularly the British Empire. Uh, so with that very, very uh, shaky introduction, let's get into the core of our, our topic, which is to think a little about the question of national security, a term that's been around for 1947 uh, since. 
I thought I'd start with uh, a kind of free association and uh, 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 repeat some phrases that I've heard on TV in the last week and get your reaction to each one. Uh, one phrase I heard uh, uh, when a reporter on CNN referred to Donald, Trump, Donald Trump's grotesque ineptitude uh, was that he didn't comport himself like a leader of the free world. When you hear those words, what do you think? I, I thought we'd go around in the circle. It doesn't have to be a long answer, but. Uh, Daniel? Uh, Daniel? Oh, uh, sure, I could start. So what do I think of the leader of the free world? Well, um, I think it just, I'll try to be as brief uh, as possible. I think that, that numerous scholars have shown that in the early 40s, the United States made a bid um, for primacy, particularly military primacy, but also economic and cultural primacy. And now, when I hear the phrase leader of the free world, um, I, I imagine that consensus behind it, the bipartisan consensus, that the United States uh, should lead the world in a meaningful sense, and that Donald Trump, a problem with Donald Trump is that he is supposedly not uh, doing that. Now, whether Trump augurs the uh, end of the American empire or a shift in American foreign policy, I think is, is, is very much an open question, but I think there's a general uh, belief amongst the elite that, that the United States should be the prime world power, uh, and generally the euphemism of uh, leadership is used. I would just add that I think a lot of that argument about primacy is based on a, a view of the United States as a model nation, as an exemplary nation, bodies, the ideals of liberal ideal democracy, 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 capitalism, which ought to be exported. Uh, Nikhil, what do you think when you hear that, that phrase? A little trouble hearing that things oh. getting gar garbled at various points. But um, let me just say that the thing that comes immediately to mind was just watching comparisons today between uh, Trump and Bush and um, W. Bush and uh, uh, W. Bush's response to Katrina being compared favorably to Trump's response to COVID-19. Um, and, and it's just kind of shocking because obviously Katrina became a word for bungling and disaster recovery. Um, and so it makes me wonder about this, this term, the free world and the kind of terms that we use to think about, you know, American primacy, American power, American exceptionalism. They have a kind of, um, they have a kind of, uh, they're kind of hollow cliches at this point, but they also have this kind of sticking power in elite discourse. And, um, and they're 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 they they bear on on they bear kind of amnesia on top of them, which is we can we can never really remember the sort of the last time that we saw ineptitude, tragedy, um, miasma, destruction, uh, all wielded in the name of of good intentions or primacy or whatever. So I mean, I just I've just become very. Um, you know, very cynical about this, and, and and maybe we need to be a little hard bitten when we hear these terms now. Now, uh, isn't the term kind of coterminous with the invention of national security itself? Uh, it dates from the 40s, but somehow it survived the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, the people still refer to the the leader of the free world, even though. Uh, Arguably, of course, it never really described a world where you had some people like Somoza and uh, Pinochet belong to that category. Uh, but the, the fact that this survives to some degree, doesn't it sort of suggest that the kind of deep roots of the, this kind of category of anti-communism that grows up with uh, the term national security when we for, uh, whenever it's used? That, I suggest it's a little deeper than that. Um, I mean, yeah, in, ter in that particular form, but I think that anyone who does any work on the, on the ideology of, of empires in the 19th and 20th century, they are also describing themselves as free and bearers of liberalism and of the rule of law 
in a way, it's a term that attaches itself to imperial or hegemonic powers. Um, and it's particularly, I think, as Nikhil was saying, it's, it's sticky in the sense that it, it, it's constantly preventing reflection on even the immediate past, much less the slightly deeper past. And, um, and I think that it, those imperial implications are things that we also want to consider um, as a way of getting beyond the kind of exceptionalist narrative that's constantly raising its head whenever we talk about American foreign policy. I think I pretty much agree with that. Uh, when, when the term originated, uh, its, its purposes, I think, were primarily ideological. It, it wasn't that the, the phrase free world actually described some reality, uh, but from an ideological perspective, it was proved to be very useful both uh, at the end of World War II and I think even more so during a good part of the Cold War. When I hear people use the phrase, what strikes me is that this is an example, and the phrase gets used primarily in elite circles, uh, both among journalists, uh, members of the foreign policy establishment, politicians. It, it is indicative of an absolute refusal to learn mm -hmm. because the term suggests that we're still back in the 1950s. Uh, and so even though the Cold War is now, what, three decades in the past? Uh, to, to, to cling to that kind of a construct, I think very much illustrates uh, the refusal of uh, elites uh, to, to take on board how radically different uh, our circumstances are today. And just to briefly add to that, I, if any of my co-panelists um, want to want to disagree or, or or expand upon what I say, it also seems like, and maybe I'm wrong, but a lot of the people who are literally commenting on and making U.S. foreign policy today are the same people who were making it 30 or 40 years ago. So I often I I often wonder about sort of the the, the generational structure that shapes how um, America and the world is spoken about, and particularly in elite circles. Why is that? Why, why is that the case, do you think? Um, for several reasons. I think you see it throughout the political economy. I think you see a, a general democratic move for a variety of, of, of reasons, given the peculiarities of the boomer generation, both culturally and, and sort of what was presented to them and the lack of savings and things along those lines. So I'm sure it's just reflective um, in some sense uh, of that general thing, but also more specifically to American foreign policy. Um, I think it's difficult as, as, as you know, the creation of the Quincy Institute itself suggests to make a career in Washington unless you abide by a peculiar set of beliefs. And, uh, and you know, once you're in, you're kind of in forever. And, and Elliot Abrams strikes me as someone like that, or, 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 or Paul Wolfowitz still being spoken about, um, probably a lot of the Biden foreign policy team. So it just seems like, it, like it's reflective of sort of an intellectual inertia that, that we haven't quite seen before in the post-World uh, War II era. The thing that always strikes, strikes me is that, for example, when Don Rice became the head of the Rand Corporation in the early 70s, he was 33 years old. And I couldn't imagine something like that happening today. Someone had a major foreign policy organization being of a younger generation. So it just seems like something that, that isn't often spoken about, but is nevertheless important, if that makes sense. Can I just um, insert one thing? I don't know if you saw Stacey Abrams' piece just that came out in Foreign, Pol foreign Affairs just two days ago. And it, 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 was, it could have been auto-generated by precisely the people that Daniel's talking about by, by what's the, called the blob, right? It really, it, it, it threw it, it was, it was a, in a Trumpian sense, a word salad of foreign policy platitudes, um, a model nation leadership. And, uh, it, and if she's running for vice president uh, in the sense here, she's going about it by going to exactly the people who generate this narrative. You have a good phrase uh, describing the kind of parallel worlds between our, what you call our globe-spanning, resource-draining military and security apparatus, 
which exists in an entirely parallel universe to the one that most ex Americans experience on a daily level. So this sense of kind of two worlds, uh, a world of elite speak, uh, where people write for foreign affairs and use phrases like our global leadership or the indispensable nation or appeal to a kind of American exceptionalism or uh, uh, argue that the world is waiting for our leadership. Uh, you know, it's a kind of autistic world which doesn't take anything in from the world or learn from its successive series of defeats one after the other. It, it I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I agree with you. In okay. other words, I'm, I'm not sure that, uh, that it, this is simply an elite phenomenon. Uh, it is an elite phenomenon. Uh, but my sense uh, is that uh, there are a very substantial number of our fellow citizens who, who, who respond favorably to those sorts of claims, you know, who, who want to believe that. Uh, you know, we, we still are the, are the, are the chosen uh, nation. There was a piece the other day, it was, it was, first, it was first in the, in the Times and then appeared in my local paper, the Boston Globe. I can't remember the name of the journalist who wrote it, but she, she was bemoaning the fact that the nation that had defeated fascism, and that was what she wrote. She didn't, she didn't write the nation that along with the Soviets and the Brits had, the nation that had defeated fascism, she was bemoaning the fact that that nation was performing so uh, poorly in uh, responding to the, the, the pandemic. And that struck me, again, my sense is she's a younger person, struck me because I do think that, that it's not simply the blob uh, that clings to the belief in our uh, our exceptional uh, role in history. I think that it, it's, it's pretty darn pervasive. Um, I guess so, because uh, there's a phrase that occurs at every Super Bowl that always strikes astonishment in my heart that it just passes by with no comment. Uh, but there's the line always, this broadcast is dedicated to our men and women in uniform who are serving in 160 countries around the world on 800 bases or whatever. And you hear this and think that people say this phrase without reflecting what it means uh, or thinking it's entirely normal that people should, or everybody should be stationed everywhere else. And uh, one would have to say that it's been naturalized that notion that we do somewhat have a, a role uh, that requires our presence with bases abroad everywhere, and it, that if we were to pull them back, something terrible would happen to the country. So I, I can't disagree with that. I would add, though, um, I think it's important to think about what are the discontinuities of the way American primacy has been articulated um, since 1947, uh, since the 1940s. And it seems to me there's a couple of things that make the post-Cold War period and our contemporary period in particular, very distinctive. One is about the role of soldiers and kind of traditional combat in general. Like it's actually the case that since Vietnam, very few of American soldiers are engaged in, in conventional wars. Um, so it means that the kinds of casualties that propelled an anti-war movement in, in the context of Vietnam that doesn't exist. I mean, we have a whole apparatus to make violence and the, co the costs of violence invisible to American citizens. Whereas the costs of violence in lives lost abroad are much higher. I mean, I think we can think also about the expansive role of economic sanctions um, in the post-Cold War period as another way in which the costs of war are kind of made invisible to American citizens, even as they're being exacerbated uh, outside of our borders. So I think that the transformation of how it is that America exerts itself on the global stage is one way to think about the difference. I think a second is the 
post-war post period of the 40s, um, there was this a uh, kind of commitment to a rule-bound international order. And this is an argument Aziz Rana and Asla Bali have made in a couple of articles, but a commitment to international institutions um, that were created in the image of the United States, uh, the UN and others. And not just with Donald Trump, but pr even prior to that, there's been a very steady defection from any commitment to a rule-bound international order. Um, and I think this, it's again, all in the name of America first, of the primacy of American po power, but the structure and the ways it plays out um, both internationally, and I think we can talk about domestically as well, seems to me very different in the last 30 years than the first 30 years um, after World War II. And just to quickly add to Adam's point, which I think is, is absolutely um, correct, um, I, I also think it's important to connect this this hiding, which is so central, I completely agree. And you see it, I think, particularly with the rise of the all-volunteer force, of course, in the early 1970s, and, and in more recent years, the use of private military contractors to fight America's wars, um, you know, oftentimes made up of veterans, almost always made up of veterans, and I think really critical and part of the larger story of the rise of the American contract state since the 40s, so I think that's really critical. Um, and all, uh, but to, to also connect this to, to what, what, you know, Daniel Immervar's famous book, How to Hide an Empire, this long project of hiding the fact that the United States is an empire from its, um, from the very beginning of the country with westward expansion to the, the move abroad with, um, in, in the war of 1898 to the creation of the base structure after World War II, I think that this hiding um, of, of imperialism, of militarism, of the casualties that actually result both of Americans and even more importantly of people abroad is part and parcel of the creation of American foreign policy where, um, and so much so that the, you could then have elite members of the bipartisan establishment refer to American leadership as if it's a definite good thing um, um, on its face. And I think it's a really important part of the story that we need to tell and that we need to really address. Andrew refers to the the state we're in a semi-war in one of his books. It's, we're in a perpetual, not quite war and not quite peace, where there's always something going on anywhere, but it's not of an intensity or scale to attract attention. And because largely of the casualties are kept down, there are privatized uh, contractors and so forth. I mean, so that went, uh, but, my but question believe, for- Believe uh, it or not, I think I stole that from uh, James Forrestal. Uh, who, uh, our first Secretary of Defense, who of course was a uh, you know a, a passionate Cold Warrior, uh, and even in the early stages, he he used that term to describe the contest between ourselves and the Soviet Union. I think it's more appropriate today. You know, I tell a story about Forrestal and in, in in some of the research I've been doing where. He has a conversation with Hanson Baldwin, who's at the New York Times, who's basically David Sanger's, you know, kind of distant predecessor, you know, the national security correspondent. And Baldwin writes this piece where he says, well, we don't, what, I don't really think the term national security is a good term. It's, it's really more like risk, you know, than security. And Forrestal writes him this glowing letter where he says, yes, absolutely. We need to be thinking in terms of risk management. We're really not creating a security state or, or a state that secures the well being of the population. We're creating a state that can leverage risk and opportunity. And of course, Forrestal comes out of the finance world. And I think this is a really important part of the story that the that the, 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 there are two blobs, you know, there's the, there's the blob that, that we're talking about, the kind of elite discourse that kind of talks about American primacy and the military footprint, and that there will always be something worse if the United States isn't foremost involved everywhere in the world. And of course, let's, be, let's, let's also acknowledge that Trump resists that discourse um, right now, um, more than do the, the kind of the, the, the Stacey Abrams, Joe Bidens, Obama, Obamanots, Clintonites who want to kind of bring back this sort of idea that the United States could somehow rebuild its primacy. But the other piece of that are the, are the finance people, you know, and they're kind of like the people Danny was describing earlier. I mean, why are we still talking to Larry Summers 30 years later? You know, Larry Summers, the architect of uh, essentially a kind of globalization that um, impoverishes ordinary workers everywhere, 
you know, and is now being consulted about the sort of the future of the economy on the democratic side. So it's a kind of a, there's a kind of, uh, there's a kind of way I think we, we need to be connecting these pieces better than we tend to. Um, the, 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 the one functioning institution of the American empire today probably is the Fed, you know, more than the American military. Um, the, the two great American exports are armaments and dollars. You know, that's, that's what we export now. We export dollars to the world. And I think that the, the, the dysfunction is so, so deep and profound. And I think that insofar as ordinary Americans are now experiencing that defunction in the sort of uh, the long unwinding of affluence, right? That has kind of sort of begun to travel up the chain to the middle class and even the upper middle class. I think there's an opportunity to really open up the conversation um, in a way that allows us not to devolve to a kind of Trumpian America first. We need to kind of um, sort of see everything in terms of you know bitter competition with everybody else in the world, but something that sort of salvages something of the internationalism and the idea that we need international institutions, but that really decouples them from an, a kind of a, a, an imperial primacy. Um, and that, and that then also acknowledges the ways in which we have to sort of rebuild our politics and our infrastructures and our public health system and all of these dimensions of social life that are actually the things that really make us secure in the world, right? That really contribute to a notion of security. I'm not calling for the rehabilitation of national security as a discourse, but I think we should acknowledge just how we don't live it really in a state that makes us secure. We live in a state that makes us relentlessly, perpetually insecure uh, all the time, you know? And I think that, um, I mean, now I'm just kind of soapboxing a bit, but um, I just sort of wanted to lay, lay some of that out there because I think there's a lot of candor Forrestal has at that moment of the founding of the national security state. So there's the ideology of the free world and primacy and, 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 and exceptionalism you know, that is kind of sold. But on the other hand, there's a very ruthless sense of kind of what, what they're after you know, and, 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 and a knowledge about what, what they're up to um, both in a narrow strategic sense and in a broader sense of basically policies that will favor the interests of private accumulation wherever it exists. Can I just, everything that Nikhil said, yes, that's like, yes. And I think the other part of that that we need to be doing on the left is relentlessly bringing the security budget into the picture all the time. That there's a way that the mainstream of the Democratic Party silences that, that, I mean, their nearly trillion dollar budget that was passed by 80% approval of, of the Democrats in, in December. I mean, this is, there's a low level insanity about this. No one questions money comes from it just sort of keeps coming and yet we can't fund I mean, we continually and relentlessly cut food stamps there is never enough money for what we need but somehow always enough money for this astonishing security apparatus but, but and that's something that we need to keep talking about but doesn't it seems to me that there is a, a huge obstacle uh, toward uh, that gets in the way of doing what you just suggested. And I agree with what you just said. And the obstacle is the troops. You have to support the troops. The troops need that money. You have to keep the troops safe. Uh, you know, this, this uh, the, the, so much part of our political discourse and very much both parties uh, and, and, and unless we can begin to make an argument that if you actually cared about the troops, you wouldn't be sending them around the world on, on wars that never end, uh, that, that a more critical perspective on our military spending would actually be something that would be consistent with the well-being of the troops. But I, I don't know how to do that. I mean, my own sort of little efforts have sort of poked at that, but it doesn't seem to, they got no traction whatsoever. Do you have any thoughts on how one could get traction with regard to that uh, problem? Well, I mean, there, there are basic things like asking the Pentagon to pass a fiscal audit. 
so we know where the money is spent, right? That seems like something that people, I, I, I understand, like I, I totally am with you, Andrew, in the sense that that narrative is continually used to squash all discussion of the budget and the fact that much of it is unaccounted for and doesn't go for the troops and doesn't make them or us safe. But how we switch that discourse, yeah, that's a kettle of fish um, that I, I can, Andrew, like, I mean, maybe I do. No, I mean, I mean out, out in Indiana where I grew up, uh, I don't think that people would, would care a lick about auditing the Pentagon. I mean, emphatically, that ought to happen. But uh, I, I, it doesn't seem to me that that's the kind of thing that is going to resonate with, with ordinary people who will then lean on their, their representatives to say, hey, how come we never audit the Pentagon? Because, I, mean, I mean, Daniel raised that key issue a little while ago, you know, that uh, the all got an all-volunteer force that is not representative of the country in any way whatsoever. Uh, particularly, I think, since uh, Obama became president, uh, the establishment has figured out how to wage wars per perpetually while keeping U.S. casualties low. As long as U.S. casualties are low, the American people uh, tune the wars out. Uh, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm expressing my frustration, and I hope that you can, uh, you know, offer some thoughts. Well, I have a, a thought directly related to this, and I think it, it's an issue that goes beyond the specific issue of troops, though, though that's obviously critical. And that's something the Department of Defense, of course, recognizes when uh, Secretary of Defense Gates spoke at Duke. He made this the centerpiece of his, of his talk, how they were essentially creating a warrior class or a janissary class that's you know local to particular regions of the country and, and also classes. But I think that we also have to, you know, as a left or as even critics of militarism, we have to confront the fact that there's an ambient militarism that defines American life from various flyovers at football games to the, the, the popular television programs, to movies, to video games, especially. Um, and so these are really, that's a really critical cultural um, element of what it means to live in the United States as an empire, probably going back to the beginning of, of, the, of the country and, and having to do with um, relationship and other people on this panel know more than me, but the relationship to indigenous peoples and, and Western conquest and genocide and things along those lines. So there's a very strong element of, of a kind of ambient militarism in American culture that, that we have as the, as the left in a serious sense. And I know we love talking about the base and not the superstructure uh, and the means of production, but we need to have sort of a, a cultural response in, in, in a way that, that challenges that sort of militarism that, that is just the low hum of what it means to be an American citizen or even to be someone who just lives in the United States. When you go to other countries, um, it's not the, the, the same experience. And this, of course, relates very, very co clearly and coherently, as scholars like Stuart Schrader and others have shown, to domestic American policing. And the fact that we have, you know, uh, essentially an occupying force in this country, and, and Mikhail could speak to this better than I could, um, of police that, that, that threaten particular classes and particular groups of people far more than they threaten others. And I think we have to take that sort of cultural ambience uh, head on. I'm, I'm going to just maybe... Um add a little bit of a more optimistic note into this. Um, I think, you know, we've, we have lived through a period where um, I think there's tremendous popular disenchantment with American war making. Um, so while I, I completely agree about the ambient militarism and, you know, that pulling the you know, what are you gonna do with the troops is always a kind of trump card. And, you know, there, there's, a, there's a difficulty in figuring out how to counter that. Um, I do think there's a, there's a level of, of popular realism that kind of settled into American understanding after the absolute travesty of the Iraq war, the torture scandal, the, 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 the failure of the region, um, it, it's kind of, it kind of led us to the, the sort of modest efforts of Obama to, um, you know, lighten the footprint, turn down the volume, you know, make it all more invisible again. But really, I think when Trump came into office, he really, again, came in with a pretty hard cr criticism of, of the blob of American interventionism overseas um, and of its ineptitude and its failure. So 
I, I don't know why we can't build on that um, more constructively in a moment where the COVID-19 pandemic, as, as we, we've been invited to discuss, you know, has really shown that risk management masquerading as security and protection is a complete failure. Uh, had, and you know, you, you, we've called this a viral Pearl Harbor this session, and a lot of people have tried to analogize this, this emergency to a wartime emergency, but in fact, it foils the concept of war. You know, it doesn't really work very well with the concept of war. It works much better with the concept of care, right? And I'm not saying that we can all be sort of, sort of, you know, sort of hippies and kind of like say we need to kind of care for each other and that we're finally going to sort of then sort of diffuse American militarism or detoxify the country um, of it. Um, but I do think that there's a there's an understanding of the connections between care and security. Uh, I think it's absolutely central to the Sanders campaign or what the, the Sanders campaign that was. Um, and I think that th this is a, a moment of opportunity that we have to be uh, thinking about how to build on. Um, and it's also clear that one of the, the efforts going forward on the right, especially, is going to be just to try to lay this all at the doorstep of China, right? And try to make this into, um, once again, a kind of, um, a kind of projection uh, 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 that, that, that displaces the kind of real sources of failure here domestically. Um, and I think that's also something that we can be very, um, very clear about um, arguing against in a way that will be actually quite convincing to a lot of people because there's gonna be so much rage if there's not already about, uh, 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 around the, the losses that people have incurred from this. And that rage is gonna find avenues. I mean, there is already a lot of rage here in the United States, right? Um, but we have to find a way to make this constructive. Otherwise we'll actually find ourselves in a bigger war. You know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very concerned about this. I mean, when you've got the president and the secretary of state both saying that the, the virus was concocted in a laboratory in Wuhan, you know, as their kind of election strategy, I mean, where does that actually lead us? I mean, it leads us nowhere good, obviously, right? Um, so, but I don't necessarily think they have the upper hand in that argument right now, personally, despite the ambient militarism. So a Andrew uh, had a phrase called protecting Americans at home as a possible substitute for uh, national security. Uh, it's clear that in this particular case with the COVID-19 uh, virus, uh, the casualties have been greater than some wars, like at least for American casualties in Vietnam. I think we're at 64,000 now dead in America. At the time we wrote up the description of the panel, it was 40,000, right? So uh, Bill Gates claims that with a 5% of what's spent on the de defense budget, the casualties would have been zero. So that's, that, in a way, is an audit of the defense budget. It's a way of saying, you know what? We're less threatened from Venezuela. We're not going to have 50,000 people die because Venezuela invades the US uh, than we are from either COVID or the next uh, crisis, which will be climate change, which evidently uh, there have been uh, assessment surveys by the Defense Department that take a more realistic look about the effects of climate change, both on uh, the military preparedness of bases in the US that are on the coastlines, uh, to the kind of chaos that will happen in the rest of the world to which uh, America might be drawn in as a response. So there is some sense that we're not getting the best for our money in terms of protecting the population. But that assumes that protecting the population is in fact the goal of what the people who are in charge of national security are doing. And my question is, is that the goal or is it mixed up with other things? Anybody want to take a Sorry, crack Philip, Is that the goal of national security, which is the Well, the I'm saying, goal? I guess what I'm saying is, uh, we logically think that protecting the American population is the goal of why we have soldiers, a defense force, and so forth. And so when a bad job is being done, uh, 
or let's say when the population is, the threats that attack the population are real threats like COVID and, and uh, perhaps climate change as it comes and not uh, imagined threats like uh, an invasion by Venezuela, which are kind of pushed in the, uh, the John Boltons of the world. Uh, then the question is, why aren't we responding more to the real threats than to the imaginary threats? I mean, I guess that's, I, I would phrase it that way. W what are the interests that are being served by these imaginary threats rather than not going up? It's not that these people are just stupid, I would think. And yeah, I think, that, Scott, I, I would say, and people, I'll, I'll go quickly here. Scholars generally give three explanations. One, something along the lines of a military industrial complex that there are, are economic interests that are dedicated to the particular plans and, and ide ideas of American empire. Uh, the second one uh, advanced by people like Pat Porter, um, who's uh, Gene's colleague and uh, Stephen Walt is essentially a sociological one that, and, and one I parroted earlier that there are particular, you know, to succeed in, in the foreign policy profession in the United States, you have to, again, you can't really be a heterodox critic unless you want to work for the Quincy Institute. You have to abide by, again, a peculiar set um, of principles. And then the third one is that some people genuinely believe, and I think a lot of people actually do genuinely believe, that the world will be less safe and Americans will be less safe and less prosperous unless the United States governs the world. And I think those are the major, big three major explanations. And then uh, within that, you have ideas about uh, race and sort of ideas about masculinity and, and, and world ordering that are all embedded within those three major explanations for why the U.S. does what it does in the world. And I mean, some of this also goes back to Adam's work, the, the idea that they're, you know, protecting particular kinds of forms of, of dispossession, wealth transfer, um, and that, and to do this explicitly in ways that, um, um, th that are not good for the global South, I think is part and parcel of the, the development of our security apparatus. So that that's, so this is one of the things that I find really ironic is that over and over again during the whole crisis, I keep hearing in these different articles shock from you know doctors in New York or doctors in Seattle or Donald Trump. They're like, gee, this is like a third world country here. And, um, and part of me, my, my head just wants to explode because A, there's this, this radical unknowing of what's going on in the rest of the world and other healthcare systems, but also just no sense at all that their state actually could be involved in ensuring that other states stay undeveloped and that this might have some kind of blowback on their own system. There's just, it's always as if um, Americans are just waking up to the fact that, um, that we are not who we think we are, or, or that when something like, so that's why I think Nikhil's right, like this is actually this opportunity to, to take advantage of the kind of cognitive dissonance that's coming from this, all of this, for everyone looking around and saying, my God, there is no social structure here to handle this, and using this as a moment to kind of de-exceptionalize ourselves um, and think more broadly, I think as you said about what, and all of you are saying about what security means. So who is optimistic that this moment represents a real opportunity uh, to change course? I mean, I would, I'm always somewhat optimistic. And I think as, you know, if we are on the left and if we believe in politics, we have to have some level of optimism. Um, I think in, in some ways, in part because the last four years, at least, there's been so much conversation um, around the Bernie Sanders campaign, but beyond the Bernie Sanders campaign in the movement for Black Lives, in Occupy, and in Indigenous resurgence, that for me, really in powerful ways, thinks about the connection between the domestic and the international. Um, that's calling to question precisely things like the military budget, thinking about what what it would require, what it would mean in the United States if you had free college for all, if you had universal health care. Um, you know, I think one thing, um, one kind of question I have though about those conversations is it goes back to something Andrew said earlier, but there is one version of that which is about a kind of social democratic argument that says hey, if our military budget wasn't a trillion dollars, maybe we could in fact uh, pay for universal health care. There is another, I mean, 
a kind of another version of internationalism where it's not just about can we protect ourselves and can we provide for our own citizens, but what are our global responsibilities given that our actions, American actions over at least since 19, the 1940s have generated the deep forms of inequality and hierarchy that we see all over the world. And that requires more than, you know, simply tailoring back or cutting back budgets, but thinking about other visions of global redistribution. And I think that is a conversation that's much harder to have. Um, and I'm not sure those are the kinds of conversations that are happening just yet. Yeah, I guess what, uh, I'm never optimistic about anything. And one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons I'm not optimistic uh, is that the Democrats at the end of the day opted for Biden yep. uh, for a centrist neoliberal who voted for the Iraq war. Uh, and I'm sure that people who are politically sophisticated can enumerate all kinds of reasons why uh, you know, Biden supposedly will have a better chance of, uh, of defeating uh, Trump than, I, than Sanders might have. But the Sanders program was a program for change. It was a program to seize the moment. Uh, and the, the Democratic establishment said, no thanks. Uh, so I guess my question would be for those of you who, who share some up, help me feel better. <laughs> well, Andrew, what do, you think, uh, what do you think of the big generational divide between basically everyone under 45 voting for Bernie and everyone over 45 voting for Biden? I mean, that, that is a cause for hope, if anything, that, that the next generations will have a more heterodox perspective, right? Oh, no, my, uh, but Daniel, in other words, you're saying just wait. <laughs> you know, let's let's wait ten or fifteen years, and uh, you know my generation will be either really gone uh, or in assisted living, and and your generation will then be. A re I mean, that, I, I think that's a that's a valid argument, but it's one that in the near term, you know, doesn't make me hopeful. Fair. <laughs> I mean, I think some part of it is what we. I think there's a lot of questions about why it is that, um, you know, the, how it is that the Bernie Sanders campaign um, got shut out so quickly and so stunningly in a matter of literally three days um, in early March. But I think part of the question and is about where 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 ought our optimism be at this moment and. Um, this was a real big question in the lead up to Bernie Sanders campaign, but what the connection is between kind of a, a, an array of social forces, social movements that, that are definitely much weaker than they were in the 60s and 70s, but are on the, are on the rise in a variety of forms and what the connection is between movement politics and their translation and, and into electoral politics. Um, so my, you know, it's, it, there are different ways to get at where we want to go. I think there's one version in which we get our people in and there's another version in which we have the power, the social movement power to force even the people who are not totally on our side to move closer to our side. And, you know, I think there's, seems to me there's still possibility in that second strategy um, if we are able to kind of, coalesce a kind of a, a, the forces to do that in a, in a variety of different settings in a variety of different contexts. I would kind of split the difference too. I think um, I feel optimistic about the future when I look at the kinds of arguments and energies that um, young people, younger people, people younger than me are bringing to the fore in politics um, and thinking ambitiously about. So thinking ambitiously about in ways that we haven't thought politically in a long time. I think our politics have been very fragmented, very, um, very issue driven, uh, very, very narrow at, at times um, on the left. And I think there's a there's a real sense of urgency about uh, what it will require of us to really change this situation that we're in. 
But having said that, I think, um, you know, I've lived in New York City on and off for um, the last 20 years. So there was the dot-com bust, there was 9-11, um, there was the Great Recession, there was Hurricane Sandy, which left the city without power for almost two weeks. Um, and then there's this, that's five, five major social and economic upheavals in less than 20 years that have made uh, ordinary middle-class people much more poor, uh, much more precarious, uh, without, with fewer and fewer reserves. Each one of them has been worse than the one before. Um, and I think there's no reason to think that we're not facing more on the horizon. Um, we have a government that's now becoming very uh, accustomed to the idea that it can, it can exercise emergency spending and leverage it to um, increase concentration of corporate power and an increasingly aggressive nationalism. And that's true with both political parties and they're both gonna play it opportunistically. And although I think rising nationalist conservatism is in some ways much more scary, um, I think centrist liberalism is quite ready to start wars when necessary and when they think it's necessary. Um, and both parties are part of a state whose fundamental interest to go back to something Philip asked us earlier is not about protecting us or keeping us safe. It's about harnessing our attention, our labor and our dollars to con the continued concentration of private wealth in a capitalist economy that is no longer profitable. I mean, there is so much money out there that has nowhere to go to make money. Um, and we have to find a way to redistribute that wealth. We have to find a way to tax it we have to find a way to track it because a lot of it operates offshore. I mean, this is probably one of the biggest foreign policy questions of our time. How do we track all this offshore wealth that no longer even uh, can be captured by any state? Uh, all of that's gonna require international, um, international cooperation. But in the United States, if we can start to gain some traction for our kind of politics, we can make a huge dent in these kinds of questions. Um, and, but, but the challenges are immense. So I think it's very hard to be optimistic given the challenges we're facing. But at the same time, I, I, I do think that um, these kinds of conversations, and I'm not trying to pat us on the back, but, but the many kinds of conversations that are going on um, in this moment uh, that really sound different to me than what I've heard in a long time of teaching in the university and being involved in various kinds of leftist formations um, makes me feel um, at least a little bit more hopeful because I feel like we're asking the right questions and we're trying to bring people together in a different way than we have before. And, and there's and also exactly what that, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, there, there's also, to just piggyback off that, there's also a lot more work out there on connections between U.S. imperialism and U.S. domestic policy. So I think Daniel mentioned Stuart Schrader's book on policing, Nikhil's work. There's just ways in which we are having these conversations about the relationship between sort of domestic forms of, of abusive capitalism and international forms of cap use of capitalism, domestic forms of militarized policing or national forms. And so these, the fact that that's happening now in a way um, is I think new and really important and also gives me some hope. Um, and I was just gonna quickly add, it also seems that that even in my own, you know, not too long career that, that leftists are becoming more serious about the, the, how to wield power. Um, and the ways in which you could wield power in sort of the technocratic world of foreign policy making. And I think the Quincy Institute is absolutely critical uh, critical to that. And though there ha had been groups like that, the Institute for Policy Studies before, it just, it just seemed like there's more of a momentum about dealing with questions of, of governance and power, probably largely spurred by uh, the Sanders campaign. And I think I think uh, going back to Adam's point, I think it'll be a really interesting intellectual and political problem about how to connect the sort of emerging technocracy of left-wing foreign policy thinkers and bureaucrats to the grassroots um, and, and how one could do that in a meaningfully democratic way, because as everyone on this panel knows, foreign policy and foreign policy making is one of, um, if not the most undemocratic spheres of American public policy making. Um, and so I think coming as leftists, we also have a sort of a moral obligation to think about how to democratize 
U.S. foreign policy. And again, sorry to bring up the Quincy Institute again. They're the only think tank I know that has a dedicated program to democratizing foreign policy. And these are really important questions that I think will continue to be live um, in the coming years and how, how to, you know, take policymaking power not not only away from politicians, but for the interest groups, the lobbying groups that really determine what the United States does in the world, and approaching that problem in a sophisticated manner that's serious about winning and wielding power is, I think, new and, and uh, cause for hope. I just want to go back um, to the, yeah, go ahead. Ed. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to very quickly say on this point um, that on the, at least on the grassroots side, I was at a meeting in, fe in February of sort of movement for Black Lives folks, indigenous activists, um, Iraq veterans against the war, now renamed About Face. So ver various grassroots formations. And I think um, with the idea of coming up and thinking through a kind of feminist foreign policy, um, that was the call. And I think, again, the sort of overlaps, the ways in which um, people who came to that room have found themselves at the same fights, at Standing Rock and elsewhere, has created the possibility for these kinds of conversations and synergies that did not exist, you know, even five years ago, I think. Um, and so this question then, how do you take that set of people and people in DC, like the Quincy Institute, how do you make those kinds of connections? And then how do you build kind of political majorities around the demands coming out of those spaces, I think are the questions. I wanted to- I mean, just start really quickly, just Adam, um, like when like Standing Rock is just a great example of this. Standing Rock is an international movement, wasn't it? And constantly making connections between race, empire, oil, US foreign policy, US domestic policy. There are these moments like that where that's really happening. And I think it almost exactly right at the grassroots is where it's where it's most really visible. I wanted to shift the uh, focus back for a second to the question of supporting our troops and trying to imagine what it would take to get troops to support us if we can talk of a larger movement, because I think one of the uh, conditions for change is that at crucial moments, the, the troops refuse to fire on civilians. Uh, we have a kind of a strange situation where I think the New Deal uh, is dead everywhere else in America, but persists within the armed services in a certain degree. Uh, I'm not thinking about uh, uh, those areas which are hot war zones, but the bases all around the world uh, where people live, they have uh, uh, movie theaters on the base, bowling alleys, they have, they have the sort of things that they're not going to have in civilian life. And a lot of these people, when they go back in civilian life, if they do, will end up being homeless now, as we know that happens to a lot of vets. So we have this weird situation where the New Deal persists somewhat within the service and everybody kind of likes that particular uh, uh, that particular uh, quality. Now, now, the last time we had a really uh, uh, turmoil within the service was at the end of the Vietnam War, uh, uh, and uh, a lot of I think uh, mid-level officers wrote memoirs uh, afterwards called uh, "Self Destruction" uh, by someone called Cincinnatus or "Army in Anguish." which describes a situation where civilians who were put in a situation uh, where they were in a war that they saw was futile and that the off they thought the officers were essentially uh, using the war to uh, punch their combat tickets and get promotion uh, and, and using them to do this. Uh, there was a lot of resistance in terms of fraggings, mutinies and not doing, uh, refusing to comply with orders. Um, of course, with a, all volunteer army, that seems to not be any longer on the table. But, I, but since we neglect the whole notion of dealing with the people once they enter in the service, and yet the army is such a key, uh, a key factor in the success of any kind of real radical change, I wonder what kind of ideas people have for kind of opening uh, and creating links between civilians and people in the services. Well, this is just, I mean, a very small stab at it, but I think in some ways, the very populations uh, who end up 
taking taking on the military, joining the armed forces, are the populations who are most affected by the disinvestment of the U.S. state in all our basic needs, basically. Um, so, you know, it's again in conversations with veterans who are involved in anti-war activism. This is the thing that comes up constantly. The option was volunteer for the army, or you know, the next best thing is to work at Walmart in their neighborhoods uh, and or other other kinds of options like this. Um, so I think that 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 creates, I think, some opening, some opportunity to in, include um, former veterans, especially, but also young fo folks who find themselves under similar circumstances to think through the kinds of alternatives we might, we're, we've been talking about here. Um, I mean, there's also conversations to be had about, again, how the very, the very communities that uh, uh, um, that they're coming from, that soldiers are coming from, are also the ones where um, the U.S. is engaged in uh, military exercises of various kinds. So Puerto Ricans, for instance, are overrepresented in among the armed forces. And this is a site of basically ongoing U.S. colonialism. Um, so I think there's these real opportunities, again, about thinking overcoming in different ways and thinking about different strategies for overcoming the domestic international binary that illuminates to folks in different, differently configured in different contexts, how it is that ongoing investments in the military, even when they do offer opportunities for advancement that are otherwise foreclosed in the long run undermine the very communities that folks are coming from. Well, this is complicated. Uh, remember the, the military is a hierarchical organization. And in terms of the political weight of speech, uh, what if what a retired three-star general says carries a lot more weight than a former corporal? Uh, it does seem to me that uh, in order to bring greater legitimacy to a critical conversation about national security policy and why we're spending a trillion dollars a year and why we have 800 overseas bases and so on, it would be tremendously useful to have some former senior military people weigh in on the side of the critics. Uh, that said, of course, as soon as we have them weighing in on the side of the critics, then we are in effect inviting the politicization of the military, uh, which can be an exceedingly dangerous thing. So, so this is a dilemma, uh, but it, and, and, and I mean, and, and I think to be honest, most of the former three-star and four-star generals, uh, their inclinations are very much pro-blob. Uh, so there are not too many of those folks uh, who would, would view with favor uh, the sort of critique that we are alluding to and that I think broadly speaking, we think is, is necessary. But, but this whole issue, where, where, where does the military leadership fit into this problem? I don't mean active duty. I mean, the, where, where do they fit? How could they fit? Something that maybe uh, could stand a bit more uh, thought. Andrew, I have a question. Correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't doesn't the military vote Republican um, heavily? Uh, and also, like, isn't the I mean, the military is a long political institution, going back to MacArthur, but more recently Colin Powell and the fight over um, um, gay gay uh, service members in the military. So, I mean, it, it's effectively a political institution that um, maybe that the left ignores at its own peril and, and should perhaps be more serious about. You know, winning over anti anti war not only veterans but enlisted soldiers as as well. What uh, Adam was referring to earlier, or I could be totally wrong. I think I think I put uh, MacArthur as an outlier uh, in in the American military tradition. Uh, but you're making a good point, and that is that of course uh, the services are 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 political actors, uh, but most of their political acting, and I think the gays in the military issue with Colin Powell is a very good example, uh, 
uh, find action that they undertake because they think that that important values values that matter to the military are at risk. Uh, now they managed to get over the gays in the military thing. The, the, the larger, the larger uh, sort of value is our status. You know, the argument for this trillion dollars spending, uh, the, the clout that we wield uh, inside the beltway. Uh, so yes, they're political uh, and and I think that makes it all the more difficult when people take off their uniform to try to get them think critically, seriously about what our uh, military posture uh, has led to. And most importantly, given they're constantly talking about how much they love the troops, uh, the, the costs that are, that are uh, imposed on uh, the soldiers that we sent off to fight these uh, never ending wars. Why don't we take some questions now uh, from the chat? A lot of them uh, uh, go over from a slightly different angles, some things we've discussed, but since uh, they still remain uh, uh, wonderful questions, I think. Uh, Nikhil, you say that to a certain degree, national security is over. Uh, and replaced with the perpetual reproduction of intense insecurity. However, isn't this insecurity generated by the historical project of American national security? I, I think that's exactly what I was saying. Um, I mean, I think that was the distillation of the point, which is that if you, if you take Forrestal's idea that it's really about risk and not security, it's about it's about how do you leverage risk and who absorbs the risk and how is risk distributed. And I think in all of these different ways we've been talking, you know, risk gets, gets distributed to ordinary soldiers, risk gets distributed to um, civilian life that has to bear the costs of exorbitant military expenditures, risk gets distributed to places where the United States intervenes without a plan, without, a, without thought about the place, without an understanding of the context. I mean, there's all sorts of ways in which um, there has been a, a very reckless project underway for 75 years now um, and in many ways, Americans were insulated from some of its worst harms and abuses um, and even knowledge of its worst harms and abuses. But I think one of the things that we're now seeing is just how costly it is um, for us. Uh, and I do think that that is, again, to go back to the earlier part of the conversation, one of our opportunities right now that, that there is a sense that these costs are uh, exorbitant, uh, there is a sense that the benefits to people domestically are, are limited at best, um, and at worst, um, that we now ourselves are casualties of a kind of ambient militarism. I mean, to go back to the earlier conversation, I mean, I think a lot about this in relationship to the police. I mean, NYPD is 30,000 police, and it's kind of very militaristic in its orientation towards the public. Um, how do we change the disposition within the police to have them be... Um, more about thinking about the public's well-being. I mean, I saw a video where 10 policemen were dragging an African-American guy off a bus in Philadelphia because he wasn't wearing a mask. And I was like, why don't these dudes just have masks to hand out to people? You know, I mean, it's not that complicated. But the, the sort of orientation towards, um, towards punishment, um, towards the idea that, um, that the, the public itself is a, is a threat to the prerogatives and status and decision-making authority of, of police. Um, I mean, these are things that we really are, are, are trying to you know, shift uh, culturally and they're very hard to do, but I don't think that they're impossible to do because I think um, with more organization, um, ultimately the police and the members of the police and the members of the military as, as um, as Jean was saying, and as Adam was saying, are part of our communities. There are people who have relationships to us. You know, they have mothers and aunts and sisters and brothers, right? And grandparents, and they can be brought into that relationship if we start to pay attention to them as part of our constituency. And I think that is something that the left has often failed to do in the past and that we need to do. 
let's have a question about uh, Adam, uh, Ad Adam's point about uh, disenchanting the domestic international binary and so forth. Uh, uh, Trump's particular imagination and, and a certain imagination of national security, one can call that wall building. One simply builds a wall or a fort around something and that, and that sort of deals with uh, the threats that face us. But obviously with the, this kind of spectral pandemic, we have an example of the kind of global interdependence and interconnection uh, that demands some sort of cooperation to deal with the threat uh, and so forth. Is there a, how would you see kind of uh, the ability to re reframe or refocus the Im imagination on dealing with threats around what would be effective action rather than the kind of symbolic action of building wars, building another uh, uh, jet plane that never flies, starting a, a space force and so forth. Uh, I mean, I, I struggle with this in terms of how you frame it um, politically um, and in a way that would be persuasive to a wide audience. This is sort of what I was saying earlier. I mean, I think what we need in this moment in terms of thinking about internationalism is how do you, how do you move from a kind of uh, a, a, an America first, a securitization model, to one that really thinks about collective decision making on the international sphere and and re-energizing international institutions where there is kind of multilateral forms of decision making and where which still need to be equalized. Now, the I think the question is like what we we've had a, a sort of a part of this conversation. We've talked a lot about the ways in which. Um, we could redirect resources from the military budget home, but, and that's, that's around kind of transforming the conditions of, the, of American citizens and thinking about what it would mean to actually care for the public. Um, how you make that case on the international level, how you um, internationalize the question of security and, and care, I think there's, that's a really big question for me. I mean, yeah. I, well, I find it pretty persuasive to say, of course, that we've caused the harms abroad in, in, in ways that are very much, you know, we, we, can, we can trace out the ways in which we have created the conditions in which Iran can't get the medical supplies they need or and, and Venezuela and, or, or we've left countries so severely indebted that they spend more on servicing their debt than they do on their health systems, right? Um, but how to create an argument, again, that makes that concern about the well-being of others abroad as important to us at home, um, I think that is a real, it's a hard one to make, I admit. Um, I think, yeah, and to not treat that relationship as just one of, um, as charity, as aid, as something we do because of our benevolence, as a political responsibility, I think is a really hard, um, hard narrative. And I think, I, think yeah. I, I so agree with Adam. And I also, I think part of that and what I struggle with is the, the idea that actually doing, developing the kinds of thinking about the international that you're suggesting also requires a coming to terms with a, a pretty brutal past. And that's the thing that exceptionalism makes so impossible, right? Is it, it's never possible to come to any kind of um, reflection, reckoning, if we're constantly um, caught up in these narratives that deflect everything away by saying, but we are the, the you know, the, the, the exceptional nation or so there, part of making the rewriting this narrative has to also entail and I, you know when you and I are in agreement here some kind of way of puncturing through that deflective wall so that we can actually begin the kinds of re reflection about American culpability um, and and that's going to take being more explicit about that 
in particular moments to resist the desire to do the, well, let's just cut the military budget and spend it all on healthcare. I think it is gonna require thinking in both directions at the same time. Um, and I, I am as uh, confused about how you get there as possible, but I think it, it's, it's not, it can't be avoided. Yeah, I wonder if that, that's not gonna end up being a bridge too far. Uh, when when Nikhil was uh, reminding us of the various and sundry catastrophes that have fallen our country in the past 20 years or so, uh, they're catastrophes that befell our countries, our country, that our citizens uh, felt. Uh, whether we're talking about the stupid wars that uh, went awry or Katrina or Hurricane Sandy or uh, wildfires in California, it does seem to me that this moment, uh, the, the pandemic and the moment that will follow the pandemic is a moment when the argu argument can be made uh, in ways that the American people will re be responsive to the notion that the whole structure of national security policy leaves you vulnerable uh, and therefore it needs to be changed. But to make the next okay. step, it says that, and, and therefore, uh, the, our, our priorities should focus on uh, the world's uh, problems, many of which we, we have contributed to. I think that politically, that's gonna be really hard. Um, I think that I, I agree with Andrew in the short term, but I also think it's important to have different time horizons when we're talking about these issues. Um, it doesn't seem to me too radical to imagine that in the medium or long term, a group like the Quincy Institute, for example, could write a new textbook that highlights the disasters that have befallen US foreign policy um, or the befallen the world as a result of US foreign policy. Um, so I think that, that, that projects like that and thinking creatively are also crucial to, to this issue. And I think that, that in some sense, that is the goal of, of the left at this moment when, when Bernie's campaign has really opened up the discussion to, to articulate really you know, radical ideas. So for example, um, even though this probably won't happen, why shouldn't the left articulate the idea that if the United States bombs and destroys your country, you get representation in Congress for a certain number of years? I think the phrase is no annihilation without representation, right? Now, whether or not this happens, I think expanding the political imagination of Americans is something that of American citizens, and of course there's a number of undocumented people and refugees, or miring through an awful immigration system right now as well. But in this context, we're speaking to American citizens. I think that we could view that as a generation or generations long project to expand the political imagination because I think as Adam highlighted, it's just so clear that the United States has done so much damage to the world in very direct ways like in Iraq and Afghanistan in slightly less direct ways through economic sanctions, which are pretty direct, or just in the very structure of the global political economy where the global South is on the bottom and the North Atlantic um, the, the, the home of the so-called liberal international order is at the top. And so I think delineating between different time horizons will be a crucial way that, that the left and anti-militaries broadly need to start thinking about how to transform U.S. foreign policy. Uh, questions about uh, the last period of an attempted reform after the Vietnam War in the 70s with the Church Commission and so forth. Uh, what do we do with acts of war, acts of aggression that are uh, discovered by, for, for example, suppose it turns out, as I wouldn't be surprised it did, that uh, the blackout in Venezuela uh, was produced by an American intelligence agency that was trying to overthrow Maduro. Uh, that was, that is an act of war. Uh, and it's undertaken, uh, let's say it's undertaken by uh, some some subset of the agency rather than with direct presidential uh, uh, but at any rate it was not it would not have been taken with a, some sort of congressional declaration of war shouldn't there uh, a, a radical government that that gets into power uh, the same way they would treat financial uh, chicanery as something that where some people need to go to prison uh, should essentially attack the security establishment for warlike acts, for actually trying to provoke a war, uh, and, and wouldn't the educational uh, experience of that, the fact that all that would have to come out in testimony and as evidence uh, 
advance us some way towards the goal. I don't really believe this because I sat through Iran Contra, but nonetheless, I keep proposing it again because it seems to me it ought to be done. I mean, I, I guess I want to try to take this back, use your question as a launching point to, to go back to the earlier point, which I think is so important because I think if we don't, if we, if, if we devolve to a kind of nationalism in this moment, um, we will, we will um, which is, I think, the trajectory in both parties, um, and I think we're going to travel less. There's going to be disaggregation and decouplings, uncouplings of all sorts uh, in terms of supply chains, in terms of thinking about uh, globalization and in terms of its benefits. And obviously that's already already happening. And this is not an argument for globalization, but it is an argument for thinking about how we act cooperatively. I mean, we have collective action problems at the international scale. We have problems that can only be addressed internationally, whether it's international terrorism, to use a favorite category of the, the, the national security state, but also finance, as we were saying before, climate change and now pandemics. I mean, these are all questions that require significant cooperation. And I don't know if you read the New York Times today, but they were quoting Laurie Garrett, who said, you know, every country in the world used to call the CDC when there was a problem to get like really up-to-date information. Now nobody's calling the CDC because nobody has any real confidence. I mean, you might think of the CDC as an artifact of that more robust Cold War internationalism and the EPA and other kinds of American agencies that had a certain kind of uh, reliability. They, were, uh, they, they, had, they had data and research and capacities that actually could be harnessed and leveraged on a, on a broader scale. So I think these are, these are the positive sides of a certain kind of in, set of institutions that have now really been withered, right? So we have to actually think about that at an international scale. But the, 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 the problems we have are also international, right? They're within the country. I mean, the, 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 the collective action problems we have internally are so enormous. I mean, our ability to even think of ourselves as a, as a, as a sort of people with a single set of problems. I mean, a Andrew was saying earlier, you know, all of these calamities have happened to us, but we don't actually see ourselves as, as, as having a kind of, um, you know, has, as having a kind of common project in this country. If anything, the, the deep, there's been a, a devolving towards, you know, a really bitter kind of, you know, civil war type discourse within our politics. And again, I think this is a, a, the moment and neither political party inspires confidence uh, as, the, as the vehicle for this, but this is the moment where I think we can actually make the connections between uh, being in this together in a certain kind of way. I mean, I'm as bitterly disappointed as anybody you know, here that Bernie didn't succeed. And I'm also disappointed that Bernie isn't still on the stage making these arguments. But, you know, Bernie, Bernie is an, an old man um, and in a time of tremendous vulnerability, and I totally understand that. But we need to have people on the national stage basically trying to show how we will only thrive through a cooperative orientation towards our problems. You know, and that's really what's lacking. I mean, it's lacking internally, it's lacking internationally. You know, and I, I think that, that, that to even talk about a state that could have oversight over foreign policy at this point seems almost like, like a huge reach because our state feels so dysfunctional. I mean, they can't even get COVID-19 tests for the senators. You know, they can't even get them tested let alone like have oversight over like national security or oversight over these hundreds of millions of dollars that are now at the disposal of the Trump administration to you know feed their corporate cronies. I mean, this is a really insane moment, you know, and I, 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 I'm extremely concerned about it. Um, and I think it's gonna unravel more before it comes together, but I don't think we're really clearly in the position right now to be offering um, you know, definitive programmatic models, because um, I think all the kind of everything's sort of on the table. <laughs>
Sorry. Maybe everybody can make a final statement like that. I'd... That will be mine. Excellent. Yeah. No, I mean, what I always worry about is that when people, when we are in our rage against Trump and the cronyism and the insanity and the sort of barbarity, there is this desire that you see certainly in the pages of the New York Times and elsewhere to kind of get back to things that were normal when the when America was the shining, you know, leader of the free world and everything was all right. And it's precisely that which got us here in the first place. And and in particular, I think you, Nikhil, you had said something earlier about how nationalism, this kind of right-wing nationalism is distressing, but the liberal quietism on this and the sort of liberal nationalism and the liberal inability to actually talk about and deal with that exceptionalism is, is a huge problem. And I really worry that, that we're just gonna switch sort of back into that mode. And I think that one of the things that we need to keep doing on the left in the, you know, in the wake of Bernie is to continue to insist that that is not enough, that, mm -hmm. that, 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 that we, we need to actually look at the there there and identify what we need to change. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Adam, do you have a, a final summary? I don't have um, much to add. I think the point uh, both Nikhil and Jeannie made around the, you know, one way of getting at the problem I was saying about how do you press for a more expansive vision of internationalism is to really stress this question of collective action, like to try and get over this, the kind of bipartisan narrative about who's going to do nationalism better, who's going to present the most secure version of the nation, and to you know insist that the failure, the failure here isn't that we didn't just take 5% of the defense budget to fund our response, but that we the mechanisms for international collaboration and communication have collapsed and deteriorated mm -hmm. such that we weren't even prepared for something like this. And right. that has to be kind of part of the message that any apparat, any mechanism and any context in which we would be prepared to respond to this kind of crisis or another crisis requires an international context of collaboration and communication. And, and making that possible depends on us foregoing our preoccupation with a war posture towards the rest of the world. Thanks. Uh, Daniel, do you want to? Uh, sure, I'll just briefly end. I think it's important to be as um, quote unquote realist about the situation as we face it. And, and I, I think that in general, when we're talking about um, international power, talk of American decline is far overblown. That even if there's a, a, a you know domestic or within the nation state or however we want to uh, construct it dysfunction, um, the United States is still going to have overwhelming military power, uh, overwhelming economic power. The dollar will, for the foreseeable future, remain the world's reserve currency. Uh, the United States has the ability to really destroy a lot of the world. And, and the left as, as a whole, or, or critics of, of imperialism or militarism, need to recognize the enormous obstacles that we will face um, should we try to dismantle this gigantic military apparatus from a diversity of, of interest groups, um, from people who, who make their living um, basically promoting American empire. So uh, sorry to end on a down note, but I think uh, it'll be a long, uh, long, long struggle uh, going forward to get where we want to be and, and, and in fact need to be. They've realized that we're all about ADOM and others are talking about. Andrew, final statement. Well, I, I think we've really come to a, an ex a very, very important point. I mean, my uh, sort of brief description of American politics today is we've got a Republican Party that is, if it ever had a soul, has utterly sold its soul uh, to Trump. And sadly, we have a Democratic Party that believes that Trump is the problem. Uh, and that if we can just get rid of Trump, uh, it'll be happy days are here again. Uh, I believe that Trump is not the problem. Trump is a symptom of problems that, that existed long before Trump. Uh, and, and I think some of you are, are saying that, but that 
that is not a position that at the present moment uh, gets a heck of a lot of traction. Uh, it needs to get traction. I don't really know, you know, how to, how to do that. But uh, well, we have to have a politics that is not simply focused on Donald Trump. Well, I think that's a good uh, that's a good note to end on. Uh, thank you very much, uh, all of you, Andrew Basevich, uh, uh, Jean, Jeannie Moorfield, Daniel Bessner, uh, Nikhil Singh, and uh, Adon Gatashu. Uh, it's been uh, it's been enlightening, and uh, there are of course a lot of threads to follow up. Uh, and uh, I hope there will be more discussions on what a kind of a, uh, a heretical left foreign policy alternative will be. I'm uh, happy that Quincy Institute exists to, uh, to uh, house these discussions and inspire them and that almost everybody in this uh, group is involved with it. So I wish Quincy the best of luck. Uh, and hope that America will not go abroad to destroy monsters uh, anymore. Thank you very uh, much for allowing me to participate. Oh, it's, me too. Thank it's you. a pleasure. And, Thanks, Philip. Uh, Thanks so much. Yeah. I want to see you all. Quick pitch here for money. Everybody, redmayseattle.org. Go to the site if you enjoy the conversation, if you'd like to listen to more of them. Uh, just click the donate button and give what you can. Thanks very much. And we'll see you on Wednesday.